You know, I was working on a roof one time. It had shingles on it. <laughs> shingles on the roof. And I took a step and I began to slide on those asphalt shingles. And I could see where I was going and I did not like the destination because gravity and I have a very strong affinity. <laughs> it was a slippery slope. That feeling of panic you get when you begin to fall, and I think you all probably know what I'm talking about, when you're starting to slip and slide, maybe you're walking on ice or mud, you don't have sure footing, and you're starting to go, it is a scary feeling because you're not in control. And what I want to talk to you about today is the slippery slope of sin. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn over to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. That's where we'll be reading from. And here the psalmist goes through a problem, and he describes the slippery slope. And what he began to find was he could see other people slipping, and he also could see himself slipping. And it scared him, and he is giving us some advice about this slippery slope of sin. Psalm 73. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through Fatness, their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakens. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Let's pray. Lord, Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy word. I pray, Lord, you would multiply your spirit toward us in this house, that you would fill us with the spirit 
of your wisdom, Lord, that through me you would proclaim the words that you wish for us to hear and give us, Lord, ears to hear and a heart to receive and an attitude to obey. We thank you, Lord, and praise you for all that you've done to us. Now reveal to us your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this dangerous attitude we have, I would split it into three parts that covers this song. We can say three things about it. We see, first of all, the stumbling steps of envy. Then we see the slippery slope of sin. And finally... The only remedy is the sure sanctuary of God. Let's start with the stumbling steps of envy. The absolute truth that the psalmist says, he begins with, and it's, it's one we don't need to forget, he says, God, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. God is good. We can say that, we can admit it all day long, but that doesn't mean we understand everything that God does. And the psalmist had the attitude like we see in the next picture here. He wondered if he couldn't get a better deal by trading places. The fish on the left says, oh my goodness, look at those guys over there. They got a nice fresh tank, a tropical paradise. I'm going to jump over there. And maybe we also have this attitude. You know, the psalmist said, I was envious of the wicked. My goodness, it seems like their tank is so much better. They're so much better off. And it's a problem that it does appear to us sometimes that people who have no regard for God have just a wonderful, carefree, and happy-go-lucky life. And it leaves us stumbling, as the psalmist was, on his envy, the prosperity of the wicked. And he's envious of all the good things that he sees over in that tank. And he begins to talk about what his perception of those are. He says, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pangs until death. Their, bad, their bodies are fat and sleek. He said, those fat cats, they have it good. They don't feel the same problems that we feel. We're trying to serve God over here. Now, they have it good, they have riches, they have health. In verse 12 he says, they're always at ease and increase in riches. Oh, if I could just jump over and be in that tank. But let me caution you, not so fast. Let's see what else he found out. Now, folks who had it so good and lived in that beautiful tank on the right, you would think that they would say, I owe all this to God. My wonderful situation and all the money I have in the bank and, and all of this that God has blessed me with, why well, I ought to live a humble existence and praise God. But that's not the way it is. Look at our next picture. This is what they're like. He said they're arrogant. They're lifted up in pride. He said, pride is their necklace. Think about the pictures of those rappers who have those great big old golden chains, those great gaudy chains of gold. And that's the, that's the uh, pride they're wearing as a necklace. He said, violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. They're... Hearts overflow with follies. They scoff. They speak with malice. He says they're great big bullies. They threaten oppression. Like this picture of the guy who's all full of himself. He's standing on the back of somebody else. Oh, he's just so pleased. He's so happy, so arrogant. And when the psalmist saw those, he said, why are they this way? Why does it look like they're getting away with it? He said... If you can imagine a dog with his tail just wag, wag, wag. He said, their tongue was like that. Just, it's the picture I got. He said, they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. That's the picture. They're just, it's just like their tongues walk. and said, look at me. Look at all that I've done. I'm good. I don't need your God. 
I'm completely fine without it. And off they go. And it says it fills the earth through the earth. And what is more, it's like everybody is just so impressed. It says, therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. In other words, oh, look how successful they are. I wonder what their secret is. It was the stumbling steps of envy that beset the psalmist. And that was the psalmist. He, he, he started to realize, he says, wait a minute, I'm slipping here. I took my eyes off God. I, I got focused on the uh, outward circumstances of somebody. I don't know the whole story. I, I, I forgot about God for a minute. I began looking at who has what and who is enjoying the most and, and poor pitiful me and, I, and I'm just so full of uh, uh, you know, self-pity. He says, I, I was stumbling. I was stumbling because I was envious of these people. And then he got to the point and this is why it's a stumble, because you can see he's, he's starting to slip right off the roof here, guys. He says in verse 13, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence for all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. He said, what, why am I knocking myself out to serve God when all of these sinful, proud, boastful people just go on, you know, happy-go-lucky, nothing seems to happen to them. And then he sort of comes to himself, beginning in verse 15, he says, if I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. In other words, Lord, I would have been a real downer in church. Can you imagine coming to church and somebody say, oh, what are we worshiping God for? Oh, that praise was good, Brett, but... I don't know, so-and-so over yonder, they're doing good. They're not worshiping God like we are. Why are we bothering? And he realized that he was a, he was a downer. He said, boy, I'm glad I didn't say that. That would have been bad. Well, fortunately, he does not stay in this. What is missing from his vision? Well, let's look at the second thing. The slippery slope of sin. The slippery slope of sin. You know those wicked people out there in the world, they don't have a thought or care or concern about God? The psalmist says, oh, they're on a slippery slope. They're on a slippery slope. What brought him to his senses? What caught the psalmist when he said, I was stumbling over my own enemy, and suddenly I had this realization, what was it? That's what our next picture shows. The understanding came, the big turnaround came, the, the epiphany happened. He says, when I thought to understand it by myself, when I was going to puzzle it out, figure it out, it seemed to me a worrisome, a wearisome task. Oh, but then here's where the whole thing begins to turn around. Until, verse 17, I went into the sanctuary of God, then... I discerned their end in the sanctuary of God. That's when it happened. The realization came, as it shows in our next picture. Truly, truly, verse 18, you set them in slippery places, you make them fall to ruin. How are they destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors? They're in a slippery slope, a slippery place. A great preacher named Edwards preached a sermon about how dreadful to fall into the hands of an angry God. And I, I, I was reading part of that. And part of one of his sermons, he, 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 quoted, he quoted the scripture from Deuteronomy 32, 35. It says, Vengeance is mine and recompense this is God talking, for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. The slippery place. Guys, this world is in a slippery place. Think about what that means. 
Think about when you were in a slippery place and you were walking. Your footing's not sure. You're walking on some ice and you're kind of like doing this. Or the ground is muddy and slick. Or you got on some tennis shoes that don't have a good bottom on it. You go on a, a wet floor in Walmart and it's kind of like you're, you're going to be ice skating in a minute or two. You see, the slippery place means that there is a force that is pulling you down. And you cannot deny that force. In this case, it's gravity. But God's judgment is there. They're on a slippery slope, folks. It's not a question of if. It is a question of when. Surely they are going to fall. The good Lord has given his word that it is going to happen. You set them in a slippery place. God doesn't have to shove them. They're going to fall all by themselves. Because sin is a slippery slope of doom. It is pulling down. Now, while you're looking, you ever watch those videos they put out there called fails about people falling and all of this? If you could stick to the first second and a half of one of those videos, they're doing pretty good. The guy is walking on the ice or climbing a hill, and th th nothing's happening. And if, if you were waiting for God's judgment and you were a little impatient, you might say it's not going to happen. But you know before that video comes to an end that they're going to go splat somewhere. You know that the force of gravity is going to pull them. They're on a slippery slope, one little misstep, and they are gone. Sin is a slippery slope. Don't catch yourself on it. Don't see how close you can come and play and get on the edge. Have y'all heard of, about those people they call Turons? It's a combination of the word tourist and moron. <laughs> and these are the people that go and say, oh, I want to go take a picture with the moose or let me pet the, the nice little bear cubs that wandered out of the woods. You know, just dumb stuff like that. And one of the dumb things these Turons do is they go to the Grand Canyon. Well, I'm going to take a selfie. And it's not going to get a lot of likes if I take a nice safe one here behind the ledge. So let me step over, and I'm going to get right to the very edge. And oh, look at me, and oh, and the next thing they do is go plunge to their death. Why? They stood on a slippery slope. And they defied the law of gravity. Let me tell you, folks, you'll come closer to flying on your own power and denying the law of gravity than you ever will in denying the judgment of a righteous God. Because you're not going to get away with it. It's going to pull you in. The Bible says how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly, by terrors, the slippery slope of sin. And the psalmist, in his humility that he's passed it on to us, he realized that he himself had been in his envy on a slippery slope as well. And he had a confession to make. And he said, When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Lord, I was just as dumb as an old ox. That, that old ox doesn't realize that its days are numbered. An animal doesn't have a sense of eternity like God has hopefully given you and me. I was like a brute beast, just doing what feels good, going where I want to go, enjoying life, and then all of a sudden, this is what happens. Slippery slope. My goodness. To all of us be on that slippery slope, I sure hope that there is a guardrail somewhere. I sure hope there is somebody who's going to catch me and stop me before I follow my natural inclinations and plunge to my death, and I'm here to say, thank God, yes. That's the third point. That is, the sure 
sanctuary of God. Church, we're born sinners, every last one of us. We're all on the slippery slope when we start out. We've all come short of the glory of God. Now we might think, looking over at our neighbors, hey, I'm a little further up on this housetop than you guys are. You, you're a lot closer to the edge than I am. But let me tell you something. When you go to slide, you go slow up sliding pretty quick. Don't think that it can't happen to you. Don't think that I'm young, I'm healthy, I got lots of time. When I start falling off the roof, I'll put me up a safety rope. When I go to stumbling off the edge of the canyon, I'll start flapping my arms or something. It works on Bugs Bunny. But it's not going to work in real life. Verses 23 through 28 tell us how we can avoid the slippery slope of doom. And all of these come down to the promises of God, y'all. The promises of God. Verse 23. Nevertheless, in other words, Lord, I'm like a beast, but even, even then, Lord, even though I don't deserve it, Lord, I am continually with you. Now, this is why we're not going to fall, church. Remember this, church. This is why we're not going to fall. You hold my right hand. Jesus grabs your hand and says, No, you're not slipping anymore. No, I've got you. I've caught you. You're not going anywhere. The Lord has grabbed a hold to us. If we are his children, if we've confessed our sins, if we turned our life over to Jesus, he has got you. You're not going over that slippery slope. He's got you in your, his hand. Nobody's going to pluck you out. You are secure. You are guaranteed. He's got you. He's holding on to you. You guide me with your counsel. This is the Lord saying, now you idiot. What have we discussed about getting too close to the edge? Now go back up some. Watch your step. Don't go into the same slippery mess anymore. You guide me with your counsel. And then listen to this. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Lord, when you're done holding my hand in this life, Lord, when you have done keeping me out of the slippery places, Lord, when, when my time in this life is over, it's not because you have let go of my hand. Lord, it's because you have pulled me on up to heaven. And he is a God that keeps his word. And then you can just tell, you can see that this depression and the psalmist is envy and about all the people he thought was getting away. He came into the house of God. He began to meditate on God's promise. And that truck has turned all the way around. And now he is going down the straight and narrow path. And he begins to realize some things. He says, who have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Y'all, Jesus is everything. Jesus is all you need in this life. Jesus is all you're going to need in the life to come. If you have Jesus, church, I don't care what you think you lack. You have everything that you need because Jesus Christ is our sufficiency. Amen. And we do not need anything else. Paul says, I count everything else. It's just rubbish. But knowing God, knowing Christ, even if I have to suffer, is worth it all. Church, if you don't know that having Christ is worth it all, then you need to know him a little bit better. Because he'll keep you from the slippery places. He'll keep you from falling to ruin. He'll keep you from that envy that looks on how other people are doing and taking your eyes off Jesus. He'll keep you from falling. He'll keep your feet from stumbling. Now, it's not like we are impervious to failure. He goes on to say in verse 26, 
My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He says, yeah. He says, I'm faulty prone and my feet are like, I don't know. Y'all see me slipping and sliding, you'll know what I'm talking about. He said, yes. You know, my, my flesh will fail. My heart, my feelings might lead me astray. My heart might fail. He said, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Do you know what? You can, take, you can take all my possessions away. You can take my things. You can take my life even, but you cannot take my Jesus. You cannot take him who is my strength and my portion forever. But God will never fail. God will never fail. Besides Psalm 73, many other Bible passages describe the corrective attitude that we need to have when it comes to worrying about the prosperity of the wicked and does God see everything that's going on? Look over, if you will, in Psalm 37. Psalm 37 tells us the attitude that we're supposed to have. He says this. He said, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart commit your way to the Lord trust in him and he will act he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way over the man who carries out evil devices Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Delight themselves in abundant peace. Church, this is what we must do. We must commit our way to the Lord. We must trust in Him. If you're in a slippery place this morning, if you've never confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never said, Lord, I know I'm falling. Lord, catch me. Shortest prayer, <laughs> shortest prayer in the Bible was Peter's. When he looked away from Jesus, he, Jesus had called him out to walk on the water. He heard the thunder, saw the lightning flash. He began to sing, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> That's all he had time to say, because next thing was going to be blah, 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 all right. And what happened? The Lord said, well, I reckon that Peter, he wasn't quite a nuisance anyway. Y'all, we'll just be 11 from now. That's not what he said. He said, as Peter began to sink, he caught him. That hand of Christ that never lets go, y'all. He caught him, he pulled him up. Come on, Peter, let's get in the boat. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God that can be your Savior this morning. I hope and pray all of you can already confidently say, you know what? I put my trust in the Lord. He's got my hand, and when, when he's done counseling me here, he's going to pull me on up to glory. But maybe, just maybe, I've kind of got into the slippery place of envy. Maybe I've started looking just a little too much at what other people are doing and worrying and fretting about these things and not trusting God enough. You know, you can do what the psalmist did, come into the sanctuary, come to this altar, confess your sins to the Lord, confess your attitude to Him. 
That's what our time of invitation is for. Let's pray. Lord, Father in heaven, how wonderful, how great you are. Lord, you sure enough saved me from the slippery slope of sin. Lord, you caught my hand, and Lord, I know you're not letting go. Lord, I pray that I would be amenable to being led, that I would be counseled by your Spirit, Father, because I know that you have prepared a place for me, and afterward you will receive me in glory. Father, I pray you would move on every heart, that you would look and see every concern, every issue. Lord, that you would have compassion on us because, Father, we are all like sheep who have gone astray and so often our thoughts stray, our intentions become lax, we become cold. Father, quicken us in our spirit. Breathe your Holy Spirit into us, Father. We just love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.